Okay. Right, welcome to everybody. The reason we haven't had recent uh, meetings is because we've had a shortage of offers of material, but we have got a very good one this afternoon. That'll be Ed. So when you're ready, Ed, are you ready to make a start? Yeah, yes, you're, uh, uh, something's, something's wrong with your sound. Uh, it's, it's pinging a lot, I'm not sure. Is mine clear? Yours, Yours is fine. Clear. Okay. Yours is clear, so I should think if you just carry on. I got a host disabled screen sharing. Hold on, let me just check that. I'm, try I'm trying to share the screen now. It should be allowing sharing. Chris, uh, are you still there? Yeah, try try sharing now. Just tweak the um, control. Try again. Chris, it's frozen on the screen there. Okay, here we go. I'm 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 okay. That's it. That's it. Okay, can everybody see my see the screen now? Yeah, that's fine. Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, I'll start. I'm not hearing you clearly, Chris. So I'll I'll just start. Uh, when Chris asked me to speak, uh, I offered him three three lectures. Uh, one one a real serious one on Madagascar postal history. Uh, a second relating to my fraud collection, and then this one, uh, fun with us on team. And then so Chris, Chris picked this one. So if there are any problems, we'll we'll blame him for for this uh, what might be debacle. Uh, the French area one centime rate has always fascinated me, including simple one centime rates and wrapper banded postcards. Examples from France can be readily found. Examples from the offices and colonies are much rarer. I had a few examples of one centime rates franked with group type. I foolishly thought about doing a one frame exhibit on the one centime frankings, but finally thought better of it. So today some ramblings in this area will be presented. And I forewarn you the definition of ramble is a walk for pleasure typically without a definite route. Uh, and that will be the direction of today's talk. Sources for the material uh, in, that I'll be showing today, uh, it's about 80% my collection. As I said, this was a collection I was thinking about for a long time, but never got truly serious about it. Uh, I also have material from the collections and suggestions from the members of the France and Colonies Group in the United States and Colfra. And this seems to be an area that many collectors bump into. And I've taken liberally from uh, recent auction sales uh, to put items uh, 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 in the talk that I feel I'd like to comment on. So here's a, an opening example, a very simple one centime printed matter rate from France uh, uh, that was offered in, in a recent sale, probably last fall. Shows a nice example of the imperforated one centime uh, Napoleon stamp. Actually quite nice margins and a nice Paris uh, printed matter cancel. Unfortunately, uh, we, we can't see the back and we can't see the the actual printed matter to see what it's all about. There seems to be some docketing or a sentence at the bottom. I said that the harvest had been ordinary, uh, but beyond that, we don't know much about the piece, but it's a nice example of the use of the one centime and perforate Napoleon. Uh, when I had started this preparation, an example from uh, appeared in the bear sale uh, of, of recent times, uh, late last year. Uh, and Bear noted that this, this item cataloged 20,000 euros, and he had a departure price of 25,000 euros. And uh, 
you, you look at the stamp and you see it's the one some team imperfect Napoleon, a corner margin copy uh, with with a, a, a printer's indicator. I assume that's that's for alignment uh, of the sheet or something along those lines. The interesting thing to me is it, it looks like a, 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 a list of uh, a prices, a bill, uh, an invoice, something like that. Uh, uh, but Bear described it as superb. And if you look, if you look at, the, at the item, uh, you see, first off, that the, the margin is kind of close at the top, uh, top left. Stamp's a little dirty up there. Uh, and then the original item had a wrapper band, and when the recipient tore the wrapper band off, they also tore up the margin on the stamp a little bit. And when I, I looked up superb, as Bear described it, and it says marked to the highest degree by grandeur, excellence, brilliance, or competence. And, and I think Bear is, is really overstating his case in this one. And needless to say, it had it had no bidders. Uh, here's one from first one from my collection. Uh, it's the one Sun Team uh, uh, perforated Napoleon stamp on a wrapper band. And uh, the thing that intrigued me about this when I bought it is instead of black, which which is normally uh, uh, relates to death notices, uh, this one was blue. And and I uh, I foolishly tried to, it seems to have a docketing by an old hand uh, uh, at the top left. And I, I tried to read that. And to me, it, it looked like H-A-I-B-B. -B, and I was totally confused. And I, I asked Loic, who's, who's uh, with us today uh, about this. And he said, no, Ed, that's naissance. Oh, yes. So this was, looks like it's docketing of, of a birth and there's some coding on the birth mailed locally in Colmar. Uh, and it's the first time I've seen one of these and actually one appeared uh, uh, again in the last Rume sale on a wedding announcement. So I have the temporary conclusion that maybe blue was, was used for, uh, for good things. Uh, I just thought the, the, the uh, item was originated in, and was mailed to Colmar in the Alsace uh, and I thought I'd put in a picture of, of Colmar, the, the old town. Uh, my wife's maternal family came from, from Colmar. So we had a nice visit there uh, on one of, our, one of our trips to France. Here's a much more typical one son team printed matter item. Uh, uh, and uh, it, it's got a typical reason for survival. You'll notice on the rapid wrapper band itself uh, 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 at, at the center on top, it says Audos uh, and means, it means on the back and you look on the back of the wrapper and you can see that the recipient, the addressee is deceased, okay? And so this was returned uh, uh, to the company that originated it in Valence uh, and made its way to the philatelic market. And it's a request for payment of fees owed to an estate with the threat of a summons if the fees are not paid. Here's a, the exact same form, but a little, little more philatelic interest. Uh, again, you see it's mailed from Valence, but not, not to Valence, but uh, probably a town in the, in the vicinity. And when it got there, uh, uh, again, the recipient was not only deceased, but unknown. So it was returned to sender and it got a nice strike of the return to sender uh, hand stamp, uh, which, which caught the lower portion of the stamp and makes for a nice, but nicer philatelic interest in, in the item. Uh, and uh, you might remember that return to sender uh, as I'll come back to it later in the talk. Uh, this one again is another one of these one sun team uh, on, in this case, a notice for appearance at, at the Court of Commerce. Uh, uh, and again, uh, you see on the back, uh, well, first it's a, off, I should note, it's addressed to La Vie aux Dames in, in, in the tour area. And I wondered what was that? You know, to my, my French is not very good. And uh, 
I thought that that meant the city of women, and uh, I couldn't quite figure what that was. Uh, I started wondering if it's maybe maybe tour had a red light district or something appropriate to that. I, I hope red light district makes sense uh, to people from uh, from the British side of things. Uh, and uh, again, you'll note that the the uh, addressee is not known in La Vie Adam, uh, and so it was returned to the sender. And and for, for fun, I, I googled La Vie Adam tour to see what would come up, and nothing so exciting as a red light district. The La Vie Adam harks back several centuries to a time when an abbey with nuns occupied the earliest sites in the area, and it was uh, an area where they produced milk primarily for the city of Tours. So just a little, little interesting history. Here's one from the tax collector. Uh, property tax bill. Interesting that part of the tax is based on the building's numbers of windows and doors. Uh, one of the things I've, <clears throat> I've always marveled at and commented on, but no one seems to have picked up on, is the French seem to often come up with simple solutions to complex problems. And my primary example, of course, is, is the allegorical group type issue. Uh, one set of stamps, uh, one design used in all the colonial units from 1892 to 1915. That was, that was a wonderful, simple solution to the problem. Well, uh, deciding the tax on a building by the number of doors and windows just struck me as very intriguing. Here in the States, when we have a real estate reevaluation, it's, it's a real big thing and, and a big pain in the ass, if you pardon the expression. Here we see for this form, the taxes include about 92 francs on a, on a income property income of about 363 francs. And then 4.15 francs for the four openings, doors and windows. And also this was sent without an envelope or wrapper band rel relative to a piece of property on the Ile de Sol in Samur. Uh, and I thought that was interesting that anybody could open this and see what, see what the tax amount was. Uh, uh, there's nothing private about it. And here is the open form and uh, you, can, you can see the addressee, a lawyer, uh, of the owner and the property is in Samor, in the commune of Samor, the, it was posted in Samor. And uh, uh, this got me thinking about Samor. And, and fortunately, my wife and I spent, spent some time in the Loire Valley visiting. We had a car and visited the various chateaux. And when we came upon the city of, of Samor, I remember very, very clearly we made a we made a turn and, and just came upon the city and this is what it looked like with this absolutely gorgeous chateau up on the hillside overlooking the city, which is, which is deep in the, in the valley. It was just a spectacular entry for us into, into Samor. Here's one from Algeria from the collection of Ken Nilsestuen, the president of the France and Colonies Group uh, uh, US and, and it's a court summons. Uh, unfortunately, Ken hasn't opened it, it's not open, so we can't see any of the details. And the important thing is it was used from Algeria and just reminds us that Algeria was indeed part of France, one of the French departments at, at this time. Uh, this was a curious one that came up uh, uh, as a result of the announcement of my talk, this talk for the France and Colonies Group in the US someone had come across a one centime wrapper band, uh, perforated Napoleon stamp that was, uh, looked like it was from Pondicherry, French India. Uh, the problem was there was no one centime rate to France from French India in 1874. The one centime Napoleon was not issued for use in, Fran in French India. And actually two examples of this have now come up the same, the same uh, wrapper band no content, context, and there's no information in, in the sales on transit, arrivals, or any other aspect of, of them. And, and my conclusion is that these are most probably handbacks. Some, somebody had these in Pondicherry and got nice Pondicherry cancellations on them, 
and they've simply worked their way to the philatelic market with their handbags from the from the post office in in Pondicherry, and you can see very clearly P O N D D I C H E. And it's hard to read the rest, but it definitely looks like Pondicherry, and there's no no French town or village that that uh, begins with that spelling. The other thing you could see on these stamps, I haven't seen an example recently, is they were affixed to newspaper uh, sheets before the printing of the newspapers, and it was the printing of the newspapers that canceled the stamps. And I think this is a spectacular example. It has a wonderful freshness to it, uh, and it's canceled by the typographical printing. Catalog value is 230 euros. It's, it's sold for 39 euros, uh, so it, it didn't bring a lot of money, but uh, I think it's a very enjoyable example. Here's another bear example from the bear cell uh, on this uh, uh, newspaper from Villefranche, uh, December 1870. Uh, for some reason, a number of this, these particular newspapers have survived with various frankings. I had some with newspaper stamps actually from uh, just a little little later, and, and I enjoy this period because you, you not only have the philatelic aspects, but you've got the news aspect. And of course, the, the news here is we have the Franco-Prussian War, December 1870. We have the Declaration of the Third Republic, uh, September 4th, 1870. And uh, then we have the end of the war and the coming of the commune. In, in March, April, uh, uh, 1871. So it's a very, very interesting period of, of uh, French history uh, to be able to look at these newspapers. This is another bear example that he describes as the one sun team green bronze typographic cancellation uh, on the newspaper from Villefranche. Uh, Ceres catalog, 2350 euros, 700 euros. He describes it again as superb. And when you look at the stamp, <laughs> you, you see the stamp is, is pretty damaged on the right side and hardly seems superb. And, and there's, uh, we, we don't know if he's got the whole newspaper there. Again, a, a, a no sell. Here's one of the one son team Bordeaux and actually a really nice example, the same, same newspaper. Now we're into January, 1871. Uh, with respect with respect to the news, this is a, a Ceres <clears throat> example. And if you look at the stamp, uh, it's a beautiful example of the one son team uh, Tite Bordeaux. Uh, the only thing that's missing is, did it have a wrapper band? Sometimes you see the addresses uh, written on the newspaper uh, or did the, did the postman simply have a stack of these and he knew where they were delivered? Uh, we don't know. Again, a no sale. So this, this brings us forward and, and, and I come into the, the uh, Teep Saj uh, and the one son team issue and, and some very unusual advertising, I think unusual. And I, I, try, I tried to get these with uh, not only the wrapper bands, but also the, the printed matter advertising that went along. And here's an ad for a manufacturer of soaps and candles uh, in the town of Clichy, which is a suburb of, of Paris. And uh, there's a little cachet below the, uh, the stamp, uh, that, that small circular cachet. I'm not sure what it is. It's not readable, uh, whether it relates to the sender or not. I, I just don't know. And here's the whole ad. It's, it's actually, to me, quite an intriguing ad. Uh, it's from the Styrinery Savonnery de Clichy, the, the proprietor made stearic acid, oleic acid, and glycerin by saponification. Uh, this is fatty acid hydrolysis, uh, for if there are chemists in the audience. And in the text, he, he, he begins describing uh, his candles and, and uh, just a little English translation. The candle is without a doubt them most convenient, cleanest, most luxurious mode of lighting is also universally adopted, but not all candles are flawless. Some burn badly, give only a dim light and lack nuance. Many of them burn too quickly, run and stain. Some give off an unpleasant smell. Almost all of them have difficult ignition. However, the bougie de cliche have none of these faults. Of course, he's touting the wonders. 
of, of his own cancels. And he also sells hard and soft soaps, uh, products that you prepare from stearic and oleic acid. And you can also see from the little corner part of the advertising, uh, he submitted his products in competitions with other makers of this, this uh, uh, of these products. And he's won a number of medals, including gold medals in Paris and medals as far back to uh, uh, Napoleon the third times, prob probably uh, late 18, 1860s. And, and this ad reminded me of, you know, just, just made me think about a, a number of things. And the first thing I thought about as, a, as an erstwhile uh, laboratory chemist uh, was the continuum of science. That's a funny place uh, to, to get to. I told you I was gonna wander pretty far on this, Chris. Uh, soap was discovered 5,000 years ago, ago when early civilizations boiled plant and animal fats with the ashes from fires. And they created the chemical process we call saponification. Uh, production, the production of soaps uh, uh, evolved over the millennia to avoid the fine products that are prepared, were prepared and sold by this merchant. However, the study of chemist, the chemistry of soap didn't stop there. More recent studies of its chemistry suggest that the vesicles that it forms in water may have afforded uh, protocells, uh, precursors to cells that enable the formation of complex molecules and systems that ultimately initiated life. Wow, we go from, from making crude soap to the initiation of life uh, in this one aspect of chemistry. Here's a structure for stearic acid on the left. Uh, it's got 18 carbons, those are the gray uh, the gray spheres, the white ones are hydrogens, the uh, uh, red ones are oxygen. Uh, the fatty acid part is, is very apolar. Uh, it's it's uh, hydrophobic, okay? And, and what happens when you stir fatty acids in water, we have a saying in chemistry, like dissolves like, or like goes for like. Uh, the fatty acids associate and, and the carboxylic acids associate, and they also hydrogen bond to water, and they form these vesicles, the bilayer sheets, the micelles, and the liposomes. And you can see the concentration of fatty acid tails. These create environments when the, when the early chemicals that the Earth produced uh, during its first 500 million years, uh, these migrated inside these, these micellular and liposomal structures Chemistry occurred, and if you if you brought in two peptides, you got a dipeptide. You brought in three, you'd get a tripeptide. You bring in a heterocycle and a and a sugar, and you get a precursor to what what is a nucleoside that builds RNA. So this is all figuring in origin of life chemistry. Uh, another aspect that I think of with these ads is the wonderful French attention to detail and quality of the local and sometimes everyday product it produces in a variety of areas. And I note the metals that the producer of this soap and wax products won for his work. And this reminds me of these uh, Milieu of Yer de France that France gives out every four years to its best workers, the best craftsmen in the country. And of course, pictured at the lower right is none other than Paul Bocuse who was probably the most famous chef in the world in the 1870s, 1970s, 80s, and 90s. And so I, I think of him, and I also think of walking up Rue de Pyrenees to visit Alain Millet and his wife, Erna. Many times we had dinner at their house, and of course you'd walk up the Rue de Pyrenees and you'd pass all these wonderful French shops, I think particularly of, of the boulangeries, the bread stores, and the patisseries, and of course, uh, I remember, uh, or you know, think very often on these on these patisseries. We we simply don't have this level of excellence in in pastries in in our standard stores here in in the United States. And I think Mick has a little uh, English treat that he's having right now. And I wonder how how the, his compares to this uh, this particular example. So that was a pretty deep wander. Let's get back to philately. Uh, here's a, a wrapper, uh, uh, one centime rate for a Paris pharmacy selling among its products cod liver oil. It's two blocks from the Rue Drouot. 
just to, to put it in place and you open it up and the proprietor is selling a, a chalky gelatinous phosphate syrup, probably aluminum calcium phosphate uh, he says it's being tested in the hospitals in Paris. It's good for various diseases, including diseases of the stomach and intestines. Uh, and, and that's probably very true for the time for essentially an acidic stomach. Uh, this, this would be a nice agent to take. Uh, it's like in the United States today, we have, we have Tums and uh, other things for this mal these maladies. And in addition to his digestive elixirs, he's selling drage digestif. These are sugar-coated almonds, uh, and uh, uh, they have various usages. This probably was not particularly effective uh, for for any of this, but it has has left France with drage drage today. And Loic has pointed out to me that. Uh, these are often given out at, at, to guests at weddings and christenings still in France. And my wife pointed out to me that the Italians uh, have pretty much the same, same idea if you go to uh, an Italian-based wedding in, in, in the States. Yes, There's and, one. And Ed, Ed, I'm, I'm going to just say that I think your, your um, whatever chemist or, or, or you know, pharmacist who are selling those dragés, what he sold was simply you know, those little gelules or pills with the... Um, you know, with the coat oil inside, in the shape of a dragee, like the one you have with almond in the center. Mm -hmm. And it was, I don't know if it was good or not. It was probably tasteless because it will dissolve in your stomach and you will not have the taste of the, <laughs> of the uh, fish okay. oil in your mouth. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, we come to another area where Loic, Loic has familiarity uh, uh, Bagnier de Luchon. Bagnier de Luchon is a small village, is a small village located in the Pyrenees Mountains at the Spanish border. And this is a medical advisory on the wonders of its local spa water that the mayor's office produced and, and mailed to doctors. And uh, this, is, this is what the town looked like back in 1900. And actually, uh, Loic had the pleasure of visiting to this town. We we never made it. We did make it to uh, Banier de Begore, another spa town not too far away, and spent some of our vacation time there, although we never, well, I'll, I'll mention that in a moment. Uh, and th this, this is the properties and uses of the mineral water. Uh, and, and you can see it comes in different temperatures, different concentration of the sulfurated ingredients, and it's uh, used. Actually, you can drink it. Uh, 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 pardon me, you can bathe in it, uh, you can drink it, uh, or you can inhale the fumes. And uh, if you drink it, you can see you can cure rheumatism and syphilis, uh, uh, both of which are quite spectacular uh, cures. And of course, for inhalation, it's good for asthma, bronchitis, or tuberculosis. So I don't think that was particularly effective. But right at this time, as I was putting the lecture together in the New Yorker magazine here in the States, someone wrote a whole article on an update on French spa treatments. And, and uh, it's, I think this is quite amazing. She begins the article by saying, let's say that you suffer from arthritis. And then she lists 50 more diseases, okay? And she also notes, you also crucially live in France. You go see a doctor. She writes a prescription for a thermal cure, indicating to which of the country's 113 accredited thermal spas you'll be sent. You fill out a form, submit it with the prescription and the to the National Healthcare Service, and your application to approve is approved, it almost always is, and you're off to the water. So French spa treatments are still very, very much in fashion. Uh, these days, and it's it's something. Despite many trips my wife and I have made to France, we've never spent a, at least a weekend at a spa, and I'm I'm sorry we missed we missed that experience. Getting back to the philately, here's an ad for animal health products, uh, and you open it up, and you can see uh, uh, there are topical treatments, skin and and uh, skin and hair applica applications. Uh, for a variety of farm animals. There are elixirs uh, for farm animals and there are specialty treatments for diseases in chickens. And uh, 
I think of that uh, uh, particularly because when I, I joined Merck and Company as a chemist in 1965, and they had two important products for treatment of coccidiosis in chickens, which is one of the diseases chickens get when you when you grow them in, in quantity. Uh, this this is uh, we, we transition now to the one centime T Blanc uh, uh, stamp, which which is being used on the on the wrapper uh, on the printed matter pieces. And this is an interest ad from an interesting company. It's a current list of prices selling uh, uh, American grapevines. Okay, and you say, well, what's going on here? Don't know if you know your your French viniculture history, but of course. In France and much of Europe in, in the late 19th century, phylloxera was, was destroying vineyards. And in France, they started import, importing American stock for direct planting uh, and grafting uh, onto French roots uh, uh, to replenish French stock and to, to reactivate the, the wine industry. And this is an ad for American, American vines that uh, being sold by a French proprietor uh, in France at the time, which is early 1900. And, and here's his picture and uh, here's what your vineyard will look like if you, if you buy his American products. Uh, I think that's quite, a, quite an unusual and interesting ad. Here's an ad from a maker of shoes and boots. And uh, I, I, I was a little surprised you see at the uh, top left, uh, uh, they're they're making uh, rubber overshoes and and snow boots, but snow boots is in English, not French. And I I was surprised. The reason I was surprised seeing this in English was in the 1980s. Uh, we spent a lot of time in France, and this was this was at a time uh, when compact discs had become very popular in the United States. Uh, this new method of recording, uh, recording where you could record 70 minutes of music on, on one disc as compared to the, to the old LPs. Uh, and it was quite, quite marvelous. And in the States, we called them compact discs and maybe quickly became CDs. And when we got to France in the 80s, uh, uh, they were debating what they should call them. And, and none other than the French Academy was working on it, you can see. The Academy was the one responsible for polishing, fine tuning the French language, determining whether or not certain words are acceptable candidates. Uh, and they were working on compact discs and what should they be called in France. And of course, it, it, it came out Le Disque Alphanumerique, uh, and that was quickly abandoned by the French themselves who continue to use, uh, to use CDs. Uh, at the time, Burger King, our fast, one of our fast food restaurants, had opened its first branch in Paris. And uh, Burger King in the States, they had this one, uh, one sandwich called the Big Whopper. And they used to advertise Burger King as the home of the Big Whopper. And I, I never saw how that was translated into France. Here's uh, the ad for the shoemaker. They not only make shoes for ladies and children, they also repair shoes. And the last of the Frank ads, we got one for the a seller of exquisite oysters and with the claim that they can be shipped all over Europe with, with uh, out any deterioration and arrive in fine state. I, I wonder about that, but this is the claim and they, they reinforce mm -hmm. that on the reverse. I haven't opened this one. Uh, and you can see they're selling special, special knives to open oysters. You didn't have to put stamps uh, on, um, on these uh, uh, printed matter items. You could have a contract with the post office where you could pay in cash. Uh, and here are some examples of, of uh, unfranked uh, 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 advertising items uh, ca carried under this system. And here's a, uh, an ad for a department store. Uh, uh, the pilgrimage of, of St. John, I guess. Uh, and I see they have special conditions. I like this for members of the ecclesiastic and religious communities uh, in, in terms of sale items, but uh, uh, nothing, nothing for the atheists. Uh, 
Here's one for an ad for medical equipment. These are all Paris, by the way. Uh, and a reasonable strike of the, of the cancellation. And in the ad, you see some uh, special equipment for uh, women's bathing. You see a pharmacy to, uh, that uh, you can carry on vacations in the country, a medical service kit. You turn the, the ad over, uh, something for gathering and storing mother's milk. Uh, it's kind of a similar problem we have today. Uh, hernia belt and, and various other medical devices. Here's one for mirrors, mirrors and glass fabrications. I haven't opened that up because the wrapper band keeps that one, that one together and uh, it will fall off if I, if I cut it. So I haven't had a look at that ad. Here's a very nice one for a maker of street lamps who happen to be located at 25 Rue Drouot in Paris. And you can see these were specially prepared for the mayors of, of the towns. And you simply wrote in the, the town and department uh, uh, when you send it out. And, and these were quite elaborate productions of street lamps and then lamps you attach to, to buildings, uh, quite beautifully designed. In fact, uh, I think even today, Paris is the city of lights. Uh, and you could, you could make a little tour and look at some of these vintage turn of the century street lamps, which, which are still maintained in, in Paris. And uh, here's one of the paintings that records them uh, from that time. Uh, I noted on the web, Paris in 1894 had 461 electric arc lamps. They were making the transition, but they still had 53,000 uh, gas lights. And of course, 25 Rue Drouot today, some of you may be familiar with it, uh, one of the stamp shops is, is located right there today, uh, uh, not the lamp making facility anymore. So that brings us to the colonies. And uh, there's, there's not much from the colonies. Uh, Indochina, I, I simply have this one wrapper band, no, no printed matter context, contents. Uh, and it was, was to sent to somebody in a small village from, uh, from Hanoi. And the second one sun team rate uh, is from the French office at Canton. Uh, there are two examples of this. Alain Millet had the other. Uh, and you can see it was refused by the addressee and Bonk returned to sender again uh, uh, and not accepted. And that's, that's uh, pretty much all I've seen from the collection of the president of, of Colfra we see an example from the French offices of a one centime wrapper uh, from Tunisia uh, addressed interestingly <clears throat> to someone, someone on a ship in the Mediterranean. Uh, and then we come to Loic's uh, piece, uh, the one centime uh, stamp used on a Madagascar tele telegram envelope from Moramanga, Madagascar, addressed to a Mr. Zerling who was a philatelist. Okay, and, and the question became exactly what is this? And, and spend some time on this. Uh, where is uh, Moramanga? If, if, uh, there's Tananarive today on Tananarivo. That is the capital, major city, the center of everything in, in Madagascar. And if you proceed east, you come to Moramanga. Manga, Moramanga and, and if you can continue east and go north, you come to Tamatave today, Tamasina. Uh, which is the capital, not the uh, major port city where the French packets called uh, relative to the mails. So that's where the town is. So I went to my, my old group type uh, uh, database. Uh, the, I sold the group type in uh, 2019. Normally telegram, telegram letters were sent from uh, uh, telegraph offices uh, smaller offices to large offices where they were mailed to destination at normal rates. Okay, this obviates the, the slow overland transport of letters. And the top two, you see two different versions of, of uh, official telegram envelopes sent from Tamatave for telegrams that were received at Tamatave uh, headed for a commercial firm in, in Lyon. And both are franked at the at the 50 centime registered rate. 
uh, 25 postage, 25 registration. Below is one from the city of Majunga on the west coast of Madagascar. Again, the major port telegram was received there and then uh, transcribed and, and forwarded to uh, Marseille via the regular mails. So I had many examples of telegram letters like this, uh, also from Senegal, Sudan, Congo, Guadeloupe, Indochina, New Caledonia, maybe, maybe even more. And here's a telegram letter sheet from Gabon, from the village of Cap Lopez, uh, posted to an addressee there where it was franked at the proper 15 centime local rate, and then was forwarded to Tlemcen, Algeria, where it was received with a, a Tlemcen backstamp. Uh, also, the military franchise system uh, used, used uh, telegram, uh, telegram sent, sent by the telegram letter system. Here's one from Bobo de Lasso uh, in, in uh, Senegal, uh, a very nice small village use. Uh, and the most unusual in this area uh, are the telegram letters uh, uh, sent under the French under the franchise system, where the letter, uh, the initiating letter, came from a remote, remote village lacking a land connection to the postal system, and the optical telegraph system was used to send a letter to a nearby small village uh, with the land connection to the postal system. That's the optical telegraph on the right, and that's the coding for sending the letters. And here's a military franchise center letter sent via that optical telegraph. You can see it comes from the occupation forces in Madagascar. It's from a small remote village, I won't try and pronounce it, uh, that lacked that land connection. You see it's got the validation uh, uh, optique with the name of the village and then the name of the uh, commanding officer there. Uh, and it entered the mail a system at the newly opened small office of Ankavandra, which had been assigned a provisional cancellation because it was a new office in 1900. And it's got back stamps relative uh, to uh, Tananarive and, and it shows a Dijon arrival, but you can't read the date. And it was a four page letter that was transcribed via the optical telegraph and then sent on to its destination in, in uh, Dijon. So what do we know about the telegram letters? They're often sent from smaller villages to large towns connected to the international mail system to speed delivery. They were also sent to residents in large and small villages to speed delivery. They were always franked at standard French community rates for post postage or French rates for postage and then adding the registrations fee if, if the uh, sender wanted registration. They were, also sent to, they were also sent to members of the military under the franchise system of free, free postage. I've never seen one at the military concession rate. Uh, that would be a nice rarity if someone had it. And I've never seen anything that validates a one centime letter rate. So I think this is a philatelic letter and it's handed back to the creator at the Moramanga post office. As I said, I'm not aware of any one centime rate that will apply, apply to telegram letters. I've never heard of a one centime French community drop rate that we have in the United States that uh, uh, applies to dropping a letter at one post office from where it's delivered. So if real, this should have been posted at a 10 or a 15 centime local rate. And uh, I, I, I do not know of a special telegram rate for philatelists. However, the Madagascar post offices were very compliant with requests from philatelists. And here's a letter, uh, uh, pardon me, a wrapper to Dr. A. Volskov, who was a famous Berlin zoologist who traveled throughout Madagascar gathering mineral plant and animal specimens, which he sent back to scientists in Europe for study. He's left a legacy of genuine correspondence relating to his work and travels in the colony which I've documented in the Collectors Club Philatelist. He was also an avid philatelist and created many philatelic items for himself and his friends with the full cooperation of the postal system. And here we see a wrapper ban supporting a bisect of the four centime group type stamp to prepay an apparent two centime printed matter rate on an item he posted to himself in Tuliar, Madagascar in 1904 
at the height of the bisectomania period in the colony's uh, postal history. This was the time when Madagascar was bisecting everything. Uh, and you can see a very nice example. This is the hand of Dr. Boltzko. You'll see that in a moment, uh, writing to himself, sending this to himself. So philatelically expired, uh, inspired. Here's another letter from him, uh, written by him, posted from St. Marie de Madagascar on August 30th, 1904. Franked with a bisect of the 15 centime Zebu issue, presumably prepaying the five centime printed matter rate. But the letter had some violation of that, that rate, and it was sealed and required a 25 centime rate to get to Kassel, Germany. So at St. Marie, they hit it with a T in triangle for due. It was forwarded to Kassel. You can see that Kassel uh, hand stamp right over at the top left right over the printed matter uh, manuscript indication. And from Kassel, it was forwarded to Strasbourg where the franking was totally ignored and it was charged 40 fennec due, double the 20 fennec international rate. And you can see Dr. Volskov's hand in that he's written his return address at Tamate from where he, uh, uh, he passed in and out of that city on his way uh, to and from Madagascar over, over the years. Uh, these are things you see frequently in the group type, a, a one centime postcard, uh, implying there was a one centime postcard rate, but I've never seen one with transits and arrivals, and I think these are simply philatelic items uh, that were handbacks to the people who brought them to the post office. This is one in the Wrigley stock right now with the substantial price of 175 pounds from Hoi Hao. Uh, uh, you can see it, it bears the French Indo-Chinese offices in China, Sheen hand stamp uh, overprint uh, and, and the cancellation of Hoi, uh, Hoi Hao uh, on it, but strictly, strictly philatelic. So this brings me to Martinique where I think I, I have a one centime postal rate and the question is, is it genuine? And, and here it is, it's, a one, it's an envelope a very unusual uh, one sun team stamp, a small unsealed envelope posted from Martinique, village of origin is uncertain. It's to an own addressee, com commercial uh, uh, per person in commerce uh, in Saint Pierre uh, in, in Martinique. Uh, and, and the details about it is I purchased it in 1983 at a New York stamp show. It was in a stock of a a small postal history dealer from whom I bought a few covers each year. I had seen two sun printed matter rates in the group type. I had a number of them. Uh, and the only one sun team rates I had were the two I had just shown you from uh, Indochina and Canton. Uh, so I was concerned about this being some sort of philatelic creation or fraud when I bought it. Uh, and I spoke to Bob Stone and Stan Luft and uh, Al Alain Mier and a few other people, and I could find nothing about a, a one centime rate uh, uh, on an envelope from, from Martinique. So after I had the cover for many months, and I can't remember how many, at least six, maybe, maybe 24 months, quite a while, I, I happened to be, I had some time to spend at the New York Public Library, and I found the 1900s annual for uh, the colony of Martinique. And uh, I, I requested it and started reading the chapter written by the post office and found there was a one centime special rate in Martinique at the time for the mailing of tickets within a village or town. And these were normally lottery tickets. And for the first time I, and I think anybody else looked inside this envelope and here's what I found. It's, a, it's not a lottery ticket, it's a ferry ticket from Fort de France to Saint Pierre. Uh, Fort de France was the major commercial center in Martinique and Saint Pierre was the, was the capital. Here's the map of Martinique. You can see Fort de France and about 30 miles up the coast is the town of, of Saint Pierre. And this was the ferry that ran daily uh, uh, between, between these two towns or city and town in, in Martinique. Uh, question becomes, why does this ticket still exist? Uh, we know the town of Saint-Pierre was destroyed 
by the eruption of Mont Pelé in 19, May 7, 1902, and the ferry service ceased, okay, because there was no, there was no Saint-Pierre. Uh, so maybe the ticket was not used, but the ticket is torn, and often that's an indication of something uh, being used. We, we've seen that uh, in our own travels in France, where they'll tear small tickets. Uh, maybe it was being sent as a receipt to the addressee. Maybe there's an undetermined reason, but there is a tear right down, right down the center of, of the ticket. Uh, here's Saint Pierre, uh, May 9th, 1902, two days after the major eruption. 30,000 people had died, one survived in, uh, in a prison, in the, in the basement of a prison in, in Martinique. People in the harbor were also killed. So the black on black cancellation is unreadable. I've tried a retro reveal program, a free image enhancing program, but I can't bring up an image. Possibly one of the modern surface reflectance techniques will bring up the date stamp. Maybe we'll never know the date of posting. However, I think the letter is genuine and traveled within the town of Saint Pierre and was not caught in the eruption of, of Mont Pelé. I just thought I'd show you a retro reveal processing of, of an image and what you can do. This is something from my fraud collection, the Oxypathor Company. I'll spare you the details, but it, I, I, was, I was very anxious to know what that cachet reads, and it's kind of hard to read. And you, get, you process it, and you can see it very clearly says the Canary Islands Oxypathor Company, Las Palmas, Gran Canaria. Uh, and it's, it's a relatively rare letter from, from the Canary Islands uh, where they had an office for this. Sadly, uh, I'm having a my uh, my my PowerPoint just okay. There we go. Just locked up. It's still moving forward on the on what you share. Yeah, no, I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to uh, okay move it backwards. Okay, I put something extra there. Uh, unfortunately, uh, oh, I do have it. The the retro reveal site, which by which I did this, no longer exists, but it's been replaced by something called postmark reveal. And if you have a cancellation you want to bring out go to postmark reveal and you'll be able to process it with these image processing techniques. Finally, we come to the wrapper banded postcards. It was possible to send a postcard or an advertising card at a one centime rate if you put a wrapper band around it. This, this applied in France and the French offices, but not the colonies. I've seen a number of examples from France. I've seen a few examples from the offices. Uh, I've never seen an example with the one son team group type. I haven't heard from anyone who has. Uh, if you have, I'd, I'd be one, very happy to hear about it. Here's a ticket for a conference of Christian mothers uh, sent under the wrapper band system. Here's one for an ad for the ho a wholesale seller of herbs for druggists and distillers. Uh, here's an interesting one for a resort, a vacation resort run by a Monsieur Ronceret of Bordeaux. Uh, and you see the one centime stamp and it, oh wow, it, it looks like it has a little bluish background on it. Is this an example of the infamous Prussian blue? blue? Uh, no way. Uh, it's, it, it may be the cobalt blue, which is a, which is a nice variety, but nowhere in the, in the area of the Prussian blue. Here's the back, the advertising part for the resort. Uh, uh, here's an ad for dates and nutmegs from a, a firm in Algeria. Very, very nice. And it's nicely backstamped for arrival. Uh, here's another one of these uh, unbanded uh, uh, one sun team frankings. Again, I think these are just handbacks from the post office. Uh, here's somebody that, that tried a one sun team franking without a wrapper band, uh, without an indication of printed matter. It was Mark Dew. Uh, and they credited him with five, with one centime 
paid four centimes due, which comes out to eight centimes uh, postage. And here's one uh, to a foreign country where the one centime rate, banded one centime rate was not applicable. Uh, so it was hit with a T in triangle when it arrived in Belgium. Uh, it got the 10 centime postage due stamp, ignoring the presence of the one centime stamp. Again, from Alain and the president of Colfra, uh, an example from uh, a vineyard uh, uh, in Algeria, a very, very nice example. And finally, a proper postcard sent under the uh, one sun team uh, uh, wrapper banded system uh, from Tunisia from Alain's collection. Very, very nice one uh, that meets all the rules and, and regulations for handling these things. So why did I never turn this accumulation of material into an exhibit or an article? And there's the answer. You see what that is? That's the one sun team Prussian blue. On the left is, is a famous unused example that, sold, that was sold by Spink at the big sale of French material uh, three years ago. And one on the right is a used example uh, from a, a Robert Siegel sale, a Scott Treppel in the United States. And, and both uh, have all sorts of validation that these are one sum team Prussian blues. Catalog value of uh, 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 what sun team Prussian blue on a wrapper is 32,000 euros. I actually saw one frame exhibit. I can't remember if it was six or 12 pages of this stamp at a show in Paris in the eighties that had singles, multiples, uses on cover. Just, just unbelievable one sun team Prussian blue exhibit. So if I ever did an exhibit, the first question from the judges in the US would be, Where's your Prussian blue? And if I tried an article, it'd be the same problem. So uh, just a, a final comment here. Uh, this is a Prussian blue that is currently being offered for sale by Hipstamp. Hipstamp is a big time seller on eBay and the APS has just affiliated with them to handle its sales division of member stamps they will be going on to hip stamp and, and uh, the APS. And here's an example of what they claim is a Prussian blue uh, that they want $3,000 for. I sat on the expertizing group uh, for the American Philatelic Society for 25 years. And over that time saw 30 examples of presumed, at least presumed by the owners uh, of Prussian blues that were sent in for certificates. And I, in my whole time with the APS, I never saw a real Prussian blue uh, coming through that expertization surface. They're really rare. And this one, if you compare it to the Siegel stamp, I don't think it's a Prussian blue. It's just the normal everyday one centime Napoleon. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, they've just misidentified it. And I'm quite surprised that someone at this level is mis misidentifying that stamp. So that's sort of the end of my tale, but, but not quite. I don't know if this is gonna work, uh, but we will try. I couldn't resist bringing in Elvis Presley and a postal marking to end my talk. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to handle any comments and questions that you have. Thank you very, very much, Ed. And you want to stop sharing screen. I'm having a... <clears throat> I... Oh. Okay. There we are. Thank you very, very much. 
Has anybody got any questions? If they have, they'll have to unmute themselves and uh, put them to a head directly. Ed, going back to the that one letter that was uh, that you mentioned with the optical, you know, telegraph system. Yes. I, I wonder if the sender of that letter was actually not a, a you know uh, a soldier working at the optical telegraph you know post in that in that locality, and it would have been sent in in, in franchise, but not through the the telegraph system because for a four page letter that would have been very expensive. Well, I, I don't know. The, to me, the suggestion is that it went under the military franchise system. And, and, and I, I tried to think how long it would take to send that letter via the optical telegraph. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not like the telegraph system we're familiar with uh, in the normal telegraph. I don't know, maybe Luke would know more about that. Yeah. Can I just chip in, uh, Chris? Yes, yes, yes. There was so much that you, you there was so much that you, you you were talking about there, and I was writing down little things I could comment on or or raise questions, but I, I won't go through the whole lot. But you mentioned this little place, La Ville aux Dames, which I, I I know quite well because I was a student in Tours. Uh -huh. and it's it's a, basically a suburb on the on the left bank well most of tours on the left bank but to the east of tour but the last time i went there was with marion about four or five years ago because it's also the site of one of the biggest brocant sales in france i think it's held once a month and it virtually takes over well, a good part of the suburb so every street is has got stalls in it the mm -hmm. people who live on the sides of the streets put their stuff in the garden there's an area devoted entirely to uh, to, to to catering. It's it's it's, it's quite uh, quite spectacular, and I think anybody who goes to France would have been to a brocante to know what uh, what important institutions uh, institutions they are. But it it, it it's um, I. I knew the, the suburb when I was there in the 1960s, and I wasn't very impressed with it. When we went there this time, there seemed to be much, many more, much more landscaping that had gone on tree-lined avenues and so on. So quite a, quite a pleasant place indeed. But it's got an interesting name, as you say. I didn't know the origin of the name, so thank you, thank you for that. Well, it's it's good it come out, it came out with nuns, and and not the yeah, other way right. that you've admitted visiting there many times. So. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> but something else was that I'm very suspicious of the um, of auctioneers uh, um, categories of the condition of their stamps. I don't know uh, how many of you used to re receive the original um, Bertrandsine catalogues, but I would think that there was nothing ever below très bien. It was you go down a list. It was TB, 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 and uh, the, when you got the stuff, I mean the the, the uh, uh, the condition range for, from totally unacceptable to to nearly superb. So um, I, I don't really know what these uh, abbreviations uh, really really mean. Um, the last thing I want to comment on, which I found quite amusing, you're talking about the um, Académie Française making quite sure they translate into French the appropriate word rather than using the English or the American. Can work badly the, the wrong way. I, I took a party of school children over in the 1970s to Paris, and we stayed there for a week, staying at the youth hostel. And um, we popped into a new a new shopping area called Paris Deux, and in it there were some remarkable shops, including a sports shop that was selling um, um, oh running shoes and various kit like that. And they'd call their shop. I suppose it was to give it a bit of um, cachet. They gave it an English title for a sports shop, and they called it Athlete's Foot. <laughs> <laughs> so, someone should have told them before that went up. <laughs> well, well, uh, that, that that reminds me of, of of a British phrase that that has very different connotations in American English. And 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 that's when you uh, 
tell somebody, uh, actually this happened to friends of mine. Uh, uh, they were, uh, uh, there's two couples in two different rooms, uh, uh, one Australian and uh, uh, one British. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, they were worried about getting up early in the morning and the, and the British male said to the Australian female, don't, don't, don't worry, I'll, uh, I'll come around at 6 a.m. and knock you up. <laughs> and, and, and that has very different connotations outside of Britain. And, and, uh, yeah. Uh, so. Just to break in, Ed, we do have one more question from Philip. What was the rationale for requiring a rapper to be put on a postcard to be able to use the one song team wrote? Yeah, I, I don't know what the rationale was. It, it certainly was to, uh, you know, provide a cheaper, a cheaper service. And uh, uh, they had a very detailed list of requirements you had to meet to, uh, to get this rate. But I don't, I don't have a clear idea why it was established. And I'm wondering right now. I'm wondering what other did any other country have this? No. Where they it brought a post. It was very short lived, and nobody quite understands why they did it. Mm. I mean, a postcard for one star team is ridiculous. I mean, it's way below cost. And the yeah, idea I mean, of putting a wrap around a postcard in order to get the one star team right. Yeah, it, it's, it's well. Ridiculous. If you have the wrappers, it's it's okay, but if I, I mean, like the you know the advertising that that worked very well. They got those, they got those advertising cards for for one one song team. Uh, it, are the cards that are at this reduced rate printed paper cards, or are they handwritten? No, they're printed. The the ones I've seen. Right, because the in in Denmark the early very early postcards there were two rates. There was a two order. Uh, for in, uh, for local mail within the same postal district, and then there was a four euro for outside that district. If, however, the message on the Danish postcard was printed as opposed to handwritten, it could go anywhere in Denmark on the cheapest rate. Mm -hmm. So it sounds as though it might be something of a similar arrangement. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, three. Yes, yeah, so the one song team raised on a postcard is one of those very curious things. That was a very lovely display, Ed. Thank you very, very much indeed on behalf of all of us. Um, it is, it, it always try. I mean, one song team is a tenth of a penny. I mean, it's quite ludicrous for any um, postal rate at all. I mean, you can't cover the cost of postage. But you gave us a very full. Commentary on everything, including the, some of the. It is fascinating to look at the um, material and to look at the messages and to look at the printing and look at the what they are sending actually and all the curious things that they um, are sending at cheaper rates of postage, cheaper than letter rates. So thank you very very much, Ed. And I think that's on behalf of all of us. Okay. I'm sure it's on behalf of all of us. This is recorded, so I'll stop recording in a minute. But I will update. I will put it onto YouTube, and uh, everybody else can look at it if need be or if they wish to. It's just, it should be recorded. Now the next meeting on the 21st of February. I did send the details out. We'll try and do a meeting. Give everybody a chance to show anything but i don't give out very much response yet have you mick i've had uh, two offers so far well i've actually received the material from them well, that's um, good. which not... is not really a good start uh, when i attended the similar meeting um on the france and colonies uh, of the usa there were 10 people who mm. produced something and that made a very good very interesting and varied meeting so we are looking for that sort of number of volunteers. All you need to do is to scan a cover or a stamp or whatever it might be and send it either to myself or to Mick, and I will send out details shortly to everybody again. And we will put it together in the photo, uh, in the PowerPoint uh, display. 
it, all it needs is say the, the a, a JPEG version and um, the caption that you want for it, because clearly the dialogue, the commentary you'll be giving yourself as I show the image. So there's uh, you don't need to send me that much text, but I would appreciate uh, some more contributions, please, to make it worthwhile. It's been a very good turnout today. I think this is one of the best turnouts we've had. It would be lovely to maintain this now from now onwards. It'd be good to carry it on, but it, it didn't, mm. you know, I mean, so, I mean, for a show and tell, people have only got to do, to, you know, whatever they want to bring out, really. Everybody's got something, I'm sure. Anyway, we shall, we shall see. Yeah. But anyway, thank you very much, Fred, for that display. That was a really lovely display. And I'll try, I will arrange, if you've still got two displays to give us, haven't you? Madagascar and fraud. So we'll put them in. Well, the, the, the fraud I, I worry about, because I, I just did that for the British Empire Study Group, but about 60% of the material is British Empire. So yes. I felt that was that was proper, but I would say only maybe 20% of the material is French, maybe even less. So oh, that one's not a real French French talk, and I can't I can't <laughs> sneak it by. <laughs> The Madagascar about... one is, it's, it's an old one, but uh, I don't think anyone in the UK has heard it. I gave it, I gave it last in Germany, in Zindelfingen, at the, at the Postal mm -hmm. History show there. And I, and I actually have the whole PowerPoint in German. Uh, but I, I, gave, I, I gave a talk, I gave the talk in English, so oh. simple English. So and it seemed to work quite well with with the Germans. I think they they got a good understanding of what I was was doing, and and uh, but I, I we just learned at the British Empire Study Group. By the way, this is something for you guys to think about. Uh, Zoom now uh, it has a new feature uh, that uh, will translate the text of the speaker and and present it in typeface in any language you want. Mm -hmm. So everything I said in English could could appear in German or French uh, uh, once you added the new the new Zoom element, and you have to pay for that. Uh, but but uh, you can come out the the a viewer can bring up any foreign language they want. Yes, things are moving on very fast in this field. Actually, I will actually stop recording for the moment. Now we don't need to record any longer. <laughs>